Alright, so in this video I have a request on help with a uh, flashlight button. And you can kind of see this is what the picture looks like. And I don't have the actual button with me, so I'm just going to make up a couple of dimensions. But I'll walk you through how I got this. And uh, I already made it, so I'm not going to take up the time to make the entire part over again, because it took a little while. Uh, so I'm going to try and make this video kind of quick and easy to follow along with. I'll try and talk you through my thought process. So the first thing is that with this button, I know that it goes onto a flashlight. So I made a circle, that'd be the diameter of a flashlight, and I was assuming about two inches or so. And it might be something completely different than that. Uh, that'll be up to you to measure. But now that I have that, then I know what this bottom half of the arc has to be. Then I get the width of this button, and I can make a rectangle on here. And if I hover over this, there's a vertical constraint, um, which is not selecting right now, but there's a vertical constraint with the bottom of this here and the middle of that rectangle, so that's perfectly symmetrical. I set how wide the rectangle has to be, so I said this is about a half inch, so that's where that came from. And if I put it on top of the flashlight and I measure from the bottom all the way up to the top and then divide that in half, um, that would be the radius from this point up to the top of this. So, using my box, I don't care about the bottom half of the box, but the top half of the box, I can set the width of it, I can center it up with the origin, and I can say how high up it is above the normal flashlight. Okay, after I have that, then I make a circle that's going to be tangent to the top of that box, and I use a uh, coinciding constraint, and I don't know if I can pull that up here, it's this one. Uh, so coincident or coincident means that when you click on something, it has to be part of, it has to be touching something else. And I'll show you on here uh, my coincident constraints are on this point that the circle had to pass through that point and the circle had to pass through that point. Okay. After that, I extruded it out to be this whole length here. And I made a new sketch to try and get what this top part would be. Because if I look at this, let's see if I can scroll through a little bit. This front edge is a smaller diameter than this back edge, or radius, I guess. Smaller radius than the back edge. But they should be similar, and they do come back down to the same width here. So I can still keep that rectangle I had from before. I'm going to make a new circle. I'm going to measure here from the center of my circle, or actually with your dial calipers from the bottom of the flashlight up to the top of that ridge there, which would give me a dimension somewhere up here. I make that tangent to that line. I no longer have to do the whole center constraint thing. I just need a line to make a tangent to. And I can tell it if I project the geometry, that's this button right here, of my old points from the previous drawing, I can make the circle pass through those points as well and also have the same radius as well. Okay, so I took that and I extruded that backwards. So I'm adding material, it's a positive extrusion, adding material in a different direction than what it normally would be. Because that was my original sketch, I told it to add material that way. And that's how you can change which direction it's adding. Okay. So after I had that, I made a work plane on this top curved surface. And to do that, you click plane. You would click on the rounded surface. And then you have to reference something else. Because you can't just make a, a plane on a uh, curved surface. So I'd have to reference the, in my case, the XZ plane. So because that's parallel to this surface, it's going to make a plane that's tangent to that curve that is parallel to the XZ plane. And for you, it might not be XZ. Maybe it would be the XY or the YZ. But in my case, it was XZ. Okay. After I had the work plane, uh, then I used emboss. And with emboss... I sketched out what 
this would be. It's smaller at one end than it is the other. Uh, so what I ended up doing is I made a rectangle. And then I made lines that went from the corner up here somewhere and the corner up here somewhere. I don't really care how close it is. I'm going to fix that in a second. So I trimmed that off of each side. Then I went back to my constraints, and I said vertical constraint, that that point and this point have to be aligned. And I can kind of pull at this and set that to be a specific dimension, and set this to be a specific dimension. And if I know the distance in between the two, then I can fully constrain that shape. Now to get the edges rounded, I used a fillet, and it had to be teeny tiny, so I did 0.0625. And fill it is going to start to mess with your different constraints you had on there. But they'll fix themselves in the end. Um, not quite sure what just happened, actually. Because it looks like it added extra bits. Well, let's get rid of that. You should have something that's kind of like this, which will resemble in that part of your button. Now remember, this is being made on a plane. So if I delete all this, and I look at this from the side, so now I'm, I'm looking at uh, the plane at an angle, you can see that's not being drawn on the angled surface, it's being drawn up here somewhere. That's where the emboss came into play. So emboss allows you to take a sketch and wrap it to a face, as long as the face is uh, cylindrical. If it's conical, it may not let you do that or if it's elliptical, it may not let you do that. But when it's uh, cylindrical, it will. So you click on the image, and you click on the face, and you can tell it to add material or subtract material. So in this case, we're subtracting material. And if you know about how far down that's supposed to go, I guesstimated 0.01, then it cut out, so it looks like a little toenail, uh, 0.01 all the way around. Okay, then I made a second emboss. So I'm still making a sketch on this plane. And this time I'm using rectangles. And I'll show you, this isn't so bad. I made a rectangle. And then with circle, you have the option for a tangent circle. So you click three lines and it puts a little circle. It's tangent to all three of those lines. I did that to both sides. I trimmed off the bits that I didn't need. Oop, too much. Okay. Uh, you can measure, and you should measure, how wide this is. And you may have a hard time measuring the distance here. Sometimes it lets you, sometimes it doesn't. So I like to cheat, and I use a line at those quadrants. And then I highlight those lines, and I tell it those are actually construction lines. Then I can measure the distance between my construction lines. And if I change this to be like a half inch or 0.4, um, you'll notice that the circle states tangent to the line, so I can stretch and skew this as needed. Then I used a copy tool. It's under modify. I chose this whole thing to be my shape. My base point would be the midpoint, wherever that is on my shape. And it showed up on the one, but maybe not on this one. And I just copied that down for however many bumps you had. Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six. I should have six of these. And after I get them all in place, I can say I'm done with the copying, and now I can change the dimension. So maybe this is uh, 0.35. It's not going to affect the other ones. So I can just use that one dimension and kind of modify things. And now I get everything to line up. Use your uh, vertical constraint and match up the centers. So that one is no longer centered with that one. And now it is... I can make it to where all of them line up. 
So when you do go back to change these, they should all share the same midpoint. So, like for example, this one is the same distance in from either side. And you can see that's much smaller than this one back here. So that helps. Um, again, let me delete all this because we didn't have to do that. I already did it in here. And this time with the emboss, I told it to add material to bump back up. And I went uh, 0.01 down, so I went 0.01 back up again to get that kind of a texture. Okay, then I made an extrusion. So I decided that the shape of this should have kind of a, an angled face to it. So I roughed out the shape of kind of what that should look like, because I know it's smaller at this end than it is at this end. And when I finished my sketch, I did an extrusion, but this time we used intersect. So it's going to keep everything that was inside of that box, and anything that was outside of it, it would get rid of. And I told it to go both ways, because it's on a plane that kind of cut through the part. And extents were set to all. Okay, and then the very last thing that I had to do is I made fillets. So I rounded off the edges, and I just kind of played around until I found something that looked nice. So for all of these edges, I rounded them over 0.0625, and then on the ends here, if you look at it from the top, uh, to get those to curve in, I had a fillet on here. That's a little bit larger, but it looks like it got changed to zero. So I guess I can get rid of that. But you would just go back in, and on any of these edges here, um, you just round out those corners to where it looks a little bit more like what it has here on the piece. And if the fillet doesn't work, you can always make a new sketch on this plane and extrude cut them out. And that should get you most of the way there. There's a couple of tweaks I'm sure you could do to make it better. But I'll leave the rest up to you. Good luck.